In this video, we explore the chilling tales of some serial killers you may not have heard of before. This is the third installment in the series of serial killers you may not have heard of from different countries around the world. These killers left a trail of terror and tragedy. Learn about their methods, their motives, and the horrific crimes that made them notorious. We'll take a closer look at some of the most depraved and corrupt individuals to ever walk the earth. From their horrific crimes to the investigations that brought them to justice, we'll delve into the shocking and disturbing stories of these killers. But for those fascinated by the darker side of human nature, join us as we delve into the minds of these monsters and try to understand what makes no sense. 1. Manuel Octavio Bermudez Manuel Octavio Bermudez, also known as El Monstruo de los Canaduzles, the monster of the cane fields, is a Colombian rapist slash serial killer who confessed to killing 21 children in isolated parts of the country. He was born in Trujillo, Valle del Cauca, Colombia, on October 15, 1961. He was orphaned soon after birth and was then adopted by an abusive woman who threw him from a balcony, an incident which resulted in a broken hand and foot, giving Bermudez a permanent limp. He was then given to another family in Palmyra, his new parents were alcoholics and his father was described as being abusive. Bermudez later fathered several children of his own. He raped and killed at least 21 children in several towns between 1999 and 2003. He worked as an ice cream vendor and lured children to corn fields with offers of money for picking corn, he would then rape and strangle the children to death, sometimes injecting them with a syringe to drowsy their legs. The mother of Luis Carlos Galvez, 12, reported him missing and Bermudez was the person last seen with him. He was subsequently arrested on July 18, 2003. When investigators searched a room he rented in El Cairo, they discovered newspaper clippings about the murders, along with syringes, lidocaine, and the watch that Luis Carlos Galvez had been wearing the day he disappeared. Bermudez confessed to murdering 21 children, 17 of these were found, and he was sentenced to 40 years in prison on March 20, 2004. He is actually suspected of killing more than 50 children. 2. Volker Eckert Volker Eckert was a German serial killer who murdered six women in East Germany, France, and Spain between 1974 and 2006. Eckert only confessed to murdering six women, five of whom were prostitutes, but is known to have killed at least nine women. He is also accused of committing other murders of women in several European countries including Italy and the Czech Republic. Investigations were closed after Eckert committed suicide during his criminal proceedings on July 2, 2007. Eckert committed his first murder in 1974 at the age of 15. In his hometown of Plauen, East Germany, he strangled a 14-year-old girl to death. The girl was a classmate of his, and Eckert successfully managed to make the murder appear to be a suicide. In 1987 Eckert was sentenced to 12 years imprisonment for attempted murder in the cases of two near-fatal attacks against women. In 1994, Eckert was released and lived in Hof, where he worked as a truck driver. This job required travel to several foreign countries. According to police in both France and Spain, Eckert is believed to have killed at least five women who were working as prostitutes in these countries between 2001 and 2006. In most cases, Eckert strangled the women, performed amateur post-mortems on them, and then photographed them. He also cut the hair or dressed the dead bodies, keeping them in the cab of his truck or in his apartment. Following a murder committed on November 2, 2006, CCTV footage showed Eckert's truck next to the naked body of his victim, located beside the parking lot, this was reported to the Spanish police. Eckert could be identified via the truck, and a few weeks later German authorities arrested him in Wesseling, near Cologne, on November 17, 2006. The police discovered tufts of hair and photos of his victims subjected to various tortures in his truck and in his house. During interrogation, Eckert acknowledged committing six murders, the five prostitutes in France and Spain, and the murder of his classmate in Germany. Volker Eckert committed suicide on July 2, 2007, in the middle of the proceedings against him, he was found dead in his cell in Bayreuth. After his death the police found evidence to suggest that Eckert had killed nine women across Germany, France, Spain and Italy. 
there are also strong indications that he killed another four women. In December 2007, five months after Eckert's death, the German police closed their investigations. 3. Terry Paulin Terry Paulin, also known as the Monster of Montmartre, was a French serial killer who was active in the 1980s. He was born in Fort de France, Martinique, on November 28, 1963. His father flew to France following his birth leaving his teenage mother to raise her baby alone. Paulin was raised in Martinique by his paternal grandmother, who owned a restaurant and paid little attention to her grandson. When Paulin was 10, he started to live with his now married mother, trying hard to blend in with his stepbrothers and sisters. His behavior started to be erratic and violent towards the other children and his mother eventually had to ask his father to take him to France, his father agreed in exchange for not paying alimony. As a mixed-race student in a predominantly white environment, Paulin struggled to make friends and performed poorly at school, failing his exams. At 17 years old he decided to enter military service early and join the parachutist troops, his fellow soldiers, however, disliked him for both his race and his homosexuality. On November 14, 1982, Paulin robbed an old woman in her grocery store, threatening her with a knife, but the grocer knew him and he was soon arrested. In June 1983 he was sentenced to two years in jail but the sentence was suspended, which allowed Paul to remain free. After leaving the army in 1984 Paulin discovered that his mother and her family had moved to Nanterre, a northern suburb in Paris. He went to live with them but the atmosphere grew hostile. He became a waiter at the Parody Latin, a drag nightclub. It was there that he started his career as a drag artist, dressing in female clothes and singing songs by Eartha Kitt, his favorite singer. Paulin's mother was once invited to watch her son perform, but she left the club after just a few seconds of his act. The most important thing that happened to Paulin at the Parody Latin was meeting Jean Thierry Matherin. Matherin, 19, was born in French Guiana and was a drug addict. The pair fell in love and Paulin also became addicted, ending up selling drugs. On October 5, 1984, two elderly ladies were assaulted in Paris. Germaine Pettiot, 91, survived but was too traumatized to give a detailed description of her attackers. Anna Barbier Pontus, 83, died after she was beaten and asphyxiated with a pillow. Her killer robbed her of 300 francs, about $50. In October and November 1984, eight other elderly women were killed, mostly in the 18th precinct of Paris and its surrounding areas. The violence of these attacks was horrific, some victims had their heads stuck into plastic bags, some were beaten to death and one was forced to drink drain cleaner. In all of the cases, the motive seemed to be robbery. Some reports state that Paulin would single out women who seemed rude or unfriendly when he spoke to them, while Paulin told police that I only tackled the weakest of them. At this time, Paulin and Matherin were living a hedonistic lifestyle, spending their evenings dancing, snorting cocaine, and drinking champagne. In late November the couple decided to go to Toulouse for a few months to stay with Paulin's father. However, Paulin Sr. was unable to accept his son's lover and violent arguments ensued, ending with the breakup of Paulin and Matherin. Matherin returned to Paris alone, Whilst Paulin tried to start his own firm of transvestite artists, this plan failed in autumn 1985. Between December 20, 1985, to June 14, 1986, eight more elderly women were murdered. The police couldn't identify the killer, but the investigators did have a few clues. Through fingerprint evidence, police determined that the perpetrator was the same person who committed the 1984 murders, however, in the new murders, the killer appeared to kill their victims quicker and with less cruelty. In the autumn of 1986, Paulin attacked one of his cocaine dealers with a baseball bat, the dealer went to the police and Paulin was arrested. He was sentenced to 16 months in jail for assault, spending one year in Frayne's prison. When he was released, Paulin knew that he was HIV positive. Knowing that he was, in effect, handed a death sentence from AIDS, Paulin organized lavish parties and spent a lot of money, sparing no expense. Paulin paid for these parties with stolen credit cards and checks, as well as the proceeds from his murders. On November 25, 1987, 
Paul and murdered Rachel Cohen, 79. The same day he attacked 87-year-old Baird Final Terry, whom he suffocated and left for dead. Two days later he strangled Genevieve Germont, who would prove to be his last victim. As Paulin celebrated his 24th birthday, Madame Final Terry recovered, and was able to give an accurate description of her attacker stating that he was a mixed-race man in his 20s, with hair like Carl Lewis and an earring in his left ear. On December 1st, Paulin was arrested while he was walking down the street when local police inspector Francis Jacob recognized him from Madame Final Terry's description. After two days in custody, Paulin admitted everything, including his involvement with Matherin. He was accused of committing 18 murders and claimed responsibility for 21 and was sent to jail awaiting trial. In early 1988 Paul fell ill, his body began to succumb to the effects of AIDS. Within one year he was hospitalized in a state of near paralysis, suffering from tuberculosis and meningitis. He died during the night on April 16, 1989, in the hospital wing of Frayne's prison. Only Matherin was tried for the first nine attacks and murders, he received a life sentence plus 18 years without parole. He was incarcerated until January 2009, whilst Terry Pollan was technically never convicted of the murders of which he was accused. 4. Daniel Camargo Barbosa Daniel Camargo Barbosa, also known as Manuel Bulgarin Solis, was a Colombian serial killer who, it is believed, raped and killed up to 150 young girls in Colombia and Ecuador during the 1970s to 1980s. He was born on January 22, 1930, in Analema, Cundinamarca, Colombia. His mother died when he was young and has had an emotionally distant, overbearing father, who remarried. His stepmother was abusive and would punish him by dressing him in girls' clothing, which made him a target for bullying from his peers. His first arrest was in Bogota on May 24, 1958, for petty theft. Camargo had a serious relationship with a woman called Elcira and the couple had two children. He fell in love with a woman named Esperanza, whom he planned to marry, but found out she wasn't a virgin, this triggered an obsession. Esperanza and Camargo made a pact that he would stay with her if she helped to find other virgin girls to have sex with. This began their time as partners in crime with Esperanza luring young girls to an apartment using ruses and lies, and drugging them with sodium seconal sleeping pills so Camargo could rape them. He committed five rapes in this manner, but didn't kill any of the girls. The fifth child that was abused by the couple reported the crime and both Camargo and Esperanza were arrested and taken to separate prisons. Camargo was convicted of sexual assault in Colombia on April 10, 1964. He was sentenced to three years in prison and he was initially grateful for this, swearing he would repent and change his ways. A new judge was then given precedence over the case and Camargo was sentenced to nine years in prison, which angered Camargo and provoked him to rebel. He served his full sentence before being released. In 1973 Camargo was arrested in Brazil for being undocumented. Because of a delay in sending Camargo's criminal records from Colombia he ended up being deported and released with his false identity. When he returned to Colombia he started working as a street vendor in Barranquilla selling TV monitors. One day, when he passed a school, he kidnapped a nine-year-old, raping her and murdering her so she couldn't inform police as his previous victim had. This was Camargo's first assault involving murder. He was arrested on May 3, 1974 in Barranquilla, Colombia, when he went back to the scene of the crime to recover the TV screens he had forgotten next to the victim. Even though it is believed that he raped and killed more than 80 girls in Colombia, he was imprisoned after being convicted of raping and killing a nine-year-old girl. Initially sentenced to 30 years in prison, his sentence was reduced to 25 years and he was interned in the prison on the island of Gorgona, Colombia on December 24, 1977. In November of 1984 Camargo escaped from Gorgona Prison, known as the Colombian Alcatraz, in a rudimentary boat after studying the ocean currents, the authorities assumed that he had died at sea and the press reported he was eaten by sharks. He arrived in Quito, Ecuador, then traveling by bus to Guayaquil on December 5, 1984. On December 18 he kidnapped a nine-year-old girl from Quifeto in Los Rios, Ecuador. The following day a ten-year-old girl disappeared. 
Between 1984 and 1986, Camargo committed at least 54 rapes slash murders in Guayaquil, police at first believing that all the deaths were the work of a gang, not understanding how a man could have killed so many people alone. He slept on the streets and lived off the money he could gain by reselling ballpoint pens in the street. Occasionally, he would supplement his income by selling clothes or small valuables which belonged to his victims. Camargo would target young helpless girls who were poor and looking for work. He approached them, pretending he was a foreigner who needed to find a Protestant pastor in a church outside town, explaining that he needed to deliver a large amount of money, which he would show them to back up his ruse, and offering them a reward if they would go with him to show him the way. He would claim to be a stranger to the area, hinting at the possibility of the girls getting a job at the factory. Nobody was suspicious of an older man accompanying a young girl who could be his daughter slash granddaughter. Camargo would then go into the woods, claiming to be looking for a shortcut. If the girls would grow suspicious, he didn't prevent them from leaving. He would rape his victims before strangling them, often stabbing them if they resisted. After his victims were dead, he left their bodies in the forest to be picked clean by scavenger animals. Daniel Camargo was arrested by a pair of policemen in Quito on February 26, 1986, just minutes after he killed a nine-year-old girl called Elizabeth. They were on patrol and approached him, thinking he was acting suspiciously. They found out he was carrying a bag containing the bloody clothes and severed clitoris of his latest victim, as well as a copy of Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. He was taken into custody and later relocated to Guayaquil for identification. He gave a false name upon his arrest, Manuel Bulgarin Solis, but was later identified by one of his rape victims who escaped. He confessed to the murder of 72 girls in Ecuador since escaping from the prison in Colombia. He took authorities to the dumping grounds of the victims who hadn't yet been discovered. They had been dismembered. While he told the Ecuadorian authorities about the locations of the bodies and how sadistic his crimes were, he showed no remorse. After raping his victims he hacked, slashed and crushed them with a machete. When asked why he chose children, he said he wanted virgins because they cried, which gave him more satisfaction. According to Camargo he killed in order to get revenge on woman's unfaithfulness, he hated them for not being what he thought they should be. In June 1986 Francisco Febra Cordero, journalist for the newspaper Hoy, arranged an interview with Camargo. It wasn't easy to get the interview as police were attempting to block all access to Camargo, and Camargo demanded a large fee before letting himself be interviewed. The journalist pretended he was part of a group of psychologists that were allowed access to the prisoner, which enabled him to ask Camargo questions without arousing his suspicion. He was convicted in 1989 and sentenced to 16 years in prison, the maximum sentence available in Ecuador. While serving his sentence in the Garcia Moreno de Quito jail he claimed he had converted to Christianity. In this penitentiary he was imprisoned with Pedro Alonso Lopez, the monster of the Andes, who was believed to have raped and killed more than 300 girls in Colombia, Ecuador and Peru. In November 1994 he Camargo was murdered in prison by Giovanni Nogueira, nephew of one of his victims. 5. Gerald Stano Gerald Stano was an American serial killer who killed at least 22 women and confessed to the murders of 41. He was born Paul Zaninger in Schenectady, New York, on September 12, 1951. His birth mother neglected him badly and finally gave him up for adoption at just six months old. County doctors declared him unadoptable as he was functioning at an animalistic level, even eating his own feces in order to survive. He was eventually adopted by nurse Norma Stano, who renamed him Gerald Eugene Stano. The Stanos were loving parents but Stano struggled with discipline problems his entire life. He was a C-slash-D student in school, but excelled in music. Stano was a bedwetter until the age of 10 and was a compulsive liar. On one occasion he was caught stealing money from his father's wallet to pay other kids from his track and field team to finish behind him so he wouldn't be a complete failure. Stano graduated high school at the age of 21 and didn't go to college. Stano admitted that he started killing in the early 1970s when he was in his 20s, but also claimed at another time that he began at the age of 18, in the late 1960s. 
It is true that several girls went missing in the area at that time, but since there was no sufficient evidence when these claims were investigated 20 years later, Stano was never charged. He was known to be most active in Florida and New Jersey and by his 29th birthday was in prison for murdering 41 women. Stano was housed with serial killer Ted Bundy until Bundy's 1989 execution. Stano was executed by electric chair on March 23, 1998 in Florida State Prison. His final meal was Delmonico steak, a baked potato with sour cream and bacon bits, tossed salad with blue cheese dressing, lima beans, a half gallon of mint chocolate chip ice cream and two liters of Pepsi. In his final statement he proclaimed his innocence and diverted the blame for his false confession at Paul Crow, the lead investigator. There has been a lot of controversy accompanying Stano's criminal history, some believing that he was a serial confessor. This included arresting officer detective James Gadbury who challenged the decision to accept Stano's first confessions as true and, in 1986, signed a legal affidavit that stated that Sergeant Paul Crow was responsible for feeding Stano the intimate details of unsolved murders. According to the affidavit Stano was just parroting the information back to Crow while other veteran homicide officers later made statements saying that they had seen Crow helping Stano confess to crimes he hadn't committed. In 1995 Crow was removed from office by a grand jury, citing corruption. There was more controversy surrounding the fact that Stano, despite confessing to 41 murders, was put on trial for just one killing, that of 17-year-old Kathy Lee Scharf in December 1973. An incredible lack of physical evidence corroborating Stano's confessions made it practically impossible for jurisdictions in Florida to prosecute, and Stano's previous convictions were the result of his own guilty pleas. After a hung jury, prosecutors introduced testimony from Clarence Sack, a jailhouse informant who was later discredited when another man he had testified against, Wilton Dedge, was released after serving 22 years for rape. Lawyers from the Innocence Project discovered that his DNA didn't match that found on the victim. During a conversation with freelance reporter Arthur Nash that was secretly recorded in 1997, Zach admitted lying about Stano and other defendants, including Dedge. He said that his evidence was fabricated with the help of two county prosecutors who offered him incentives in exchange for testimony. In late 2007 an FBI lab report came to light which concluded that Stano couldn't have been the source of unidentified Caucasian pubic hairs that were found on Scharf's body. The report wasn't presented as evidence by the public defender representing Stano. The source of the pubic hairs wasn't identified and they were destroyed shortly after Stano's execution in 1998. 6. Jose Antonio Rodriguez Vega Jose Antonio Rodriguez Vega, also known as El Madaviches or the Old Lady Killer, was a Spanish serial killer who raped and killed at least 16 elderly women, aged between 61 and 93, in and around Santander, Cantabria, in an eight-month period between August 1987 and April 1988. Jose Antonio Rodriguez Vega was born on December 3, 1957, in Santander, Cantabria, Spain. Rodriguez Vega resented his mother after she threw him out when he beat up his terminally ill father. As an act of revenge, Rodriguez began his criminal career by raping many women until he was arrested on October 17, 1978 and was sentenced to 27 years in prison. However, his good behavior in prison as well as his ability to charm his victims into forgiving him meant that his sentence was reduced to just eight years and he was released in 1986. Upon his release from prison, his wife left him, a breakup that he did not take well. He eventually remarried, this time to a mentally disabled woman whom he tortured and humiliated, the whole time keeping up the pretense of having an excellent marriage. People considered him to be a hard-working man, a good person and a good husband. On May 19, 1988, Rodriguez Vega was arrested while walking in Cobo de la Torre in Santander where he was sharing an apartment with 23-year-old Maria de los Nieves VP. After being arrested, he confessed to the murders. On August 6, 1987, Rodriguez Vega broke into the home of 82-year-old Margarita Gonzalez, where he raped and suffocated her, forcing her to swallow her own teeth. A few weeks later, on September 30, 1987, 80-year-old Carmen Gonzalez Fernandez was found dead in her home, Rodriguez Vega was suspected. In October 1987 Rodriguez Vega killed 66-year-old Natividad Robledo Espinosa, B. 
beating, raping, and suffocating her. He did not kill again until January 21, 1988, when Carmen Martinez Gonzalez was found dead in her home. On April 18, 1988, he killed 66-year-old Julia Paz Fernandez, who was raped and suffocated. She was found naked. The identities of Rodriguez Vega's other victims were not released. The trial of Jose Antonio Rodriguez Vega began in Santander in November 1991. He confessed to the murders at the time of his arrest, but a trial denied all charges against him and said that the women had all died of natural causes. Rodriguez Vega was diagnosed as a psychopath with OCD tendencies. His murders were well organized in that he would first identify a victim and then stalk her until he was familiar with all aspects of her routine. He would then make contact with the chosen victim, try to gain her trust, using his charm and looks, until he gained access to her home, sometimes using the ruse of working on or in her house. He was described as cold-hearted and calculating, and he was known to have taken mementos from each of his kills. When he was arrested, police discovered a red room where he displayed these mementos, which ranged from a television to a bouquet of plastic flowers. Because of the age of Rodriguez Vega's victims, some of their deaths were attributed to natural causes. The extent of his killing spree was not uncovered until police released a videotape of his home, showing off his mementos, families of the victims identified objects that linked Rodriguez Vega to their deceased relatives. He was sentenced to 440 years in prison. On October 24, 2002, Jose Antonio Rodriguez Vega was walking in the prison grounds when two inmates attacked him and brutally stabbed him, inflicting fatal wounds. He was buried the next day in a poor coffin. The burial was only attended by two gravediggers. 7. Joaquin Kroll Joaquin Kroll, also known as the Roar Cannibal slash the Roar Hunter slash the Duisburg Man Easter, was a German serial killer who was also a cannibal and a child molester who was convicted of eight murders after confessing to 14 murders which committed in and around the Roar metropolitan region. Kroll was born in 1993 in Hindenburg, province of Upper Silesia. His father was a minor, not much is known about his mother. He was the sixth of nine children, and after the end of World War II, during which time his father was a prisoner of war, Kroll's family moved to North Rhine-Westphalia. Kroll began killing in 1955, shortly after his mother died. Around 1960 he went to Duisburg and began working as a toilet attendant for Manusmann, a manufacturer of steel pipes, before working for Tyson Industries, another large steel producer, and moving to Lahr, a district of Duisburg. At this time he resumed his killings. These are Joaquin Kroll's known victims. Ermgard Strel, 19, was raped and stabbed. Her disemboweled body was discovered in a barn in Ludinghausen. Twelve-year-old Erika Schletter was raped and strangled in Kirchhellen, now part of Botrop. Clara Frieda Tesmer, 24, was murdered in Meadows in the Rhine, near Rheinhausen. Heinrich Ott, a mechanic, was arrested for the murder and hanged himself in jail. Sixteen-year-old Manuela Note was raped and strangled in the city park of Essen. Kroll carved slices of flesh from her buttocks and thighs. Patrick Gysi, 13, was raped and strangled in Dinslake and Brockhausen. Vincent's Kuhn was arrested and convicted of this murder. Twelve-year-old Monica Taffel was killed in Walsum. Kroll carved slices of flesh from her buttocks. Walter Quicker is arrested for this murder but released. He was driven to suicide by his neighbors. Barbara Bruder, 12, was abducted in Bershiet. Her body was never located. Hermann Schmitz and his girlfriend, Marion Veen, were attacked sitting in their car on a lover's lane in Duisburg, Grunbaum. Hermann, Kroll's sole male victim, died, but Veen managed to escape. Ursula Rowling was strangled in Forsterbusch Park near Morrill. Adolf Schickel, her boyfriend, was falsely accused of this murder and committed suicide. Five-year-old Alona Ark was raped and drowned in a ditch in Vopertal. Maria Hetkin, 61, was raped and strangled in Hoxwachen. Thirteen-year-old Yuta Ron was strangled walking home from a train station. Peter Shea was arrested for the murder but was eventually released. 
he made a false confession in 1976 after being harassed by his neighbors. Taryn Topfer, 10, was raped and strangled in Vord. Four-year-old Marion Ketter's body parts were found being simmered when Kroll was arrested. Kroll was very methodical when it came to the locations of his kills, only revisiting locations several years apart. This, as well as the fact that there were other serial killers at large in the area at the same time, made him difficult to capture. Kroll surprised his victims and strangled them quickly before stripping the body and having sex with it, often masturbating over it afterwards. He would mutilate the corpses and cut off pieces that he would take home to eat later. After returning home, Kroll would have sex with a rubber doll he kept for this very purpose. On July 3, 1976, Kroll was arrested for the kidnap and murder of four-year-old Marion Ketter. Police were asking questions door-to-door -door when one of Kroll's neighbors approached them and said that the waste pipe in his apartment building was blocked and when he had asked Kroll if he knew what was blocking it, he had replied, Guts. After hearing this, police went to Kroll's apartment and found Ketter's body cut up, some parts in the refrigerator, a hand cooking in a pan of water and her entral stuck in the waste pipe. Kroll was immediately arrested. He admitted the murder, and 13 others plus one attempted murder all taking place over the previous two decades. Kroll admitted to slicing portions of flesh from his victims to cook and eat, claiming that this helped him save on the grocery bill. Whilst in custody, Kroll believed he was going to be operated on to cure him of his murderous urges before being released from prison. Instead, Kroll was charged with eight murders and one attempted murder. In April 1982 Joaquin Kroll was convicted on all counts and given a life sentence. He died of a heart attack in 1991 in the prison of Rainback. H. Michel Fournerette Michel Fournerette is a French serial killer who kidnapped, raped and murdered nine girls in a 14-year span from 1987 to 2001. He was accused of an additional 10 murders in France and Belgium and was found guilty of seven of these charges. His trials began on March 27, 2008 and ended on May 28. He has been known as the Ogre-slash-Beast of the Ardennes. Fournerette was arrested after the botched kidnap attempt of a Belgian girl in June 2003. His wife, Monique Olivier, came clean to police after hearing about Michelle Martin, wife of child murderer Marc Dutrex, and how she was convicted as an accessory in his crimes. Fournerette was charged with the abduction of children and sexual misconduct, and has been in prison since June 2003 for the attempted kidnapping of a 14-year-old girl in 2000. Olivier was charged with one murder and for helping with six more. Fournerette is known to have buried at least two victims at his Sade Chateau near Dongery in the French Ardennes in the late 80s. On July 3, 2004, a team of French-slash-Belgian police recovered the bodies of two of his victims. Fournerette was sentenced to life in prison, and Olivier was sentenced to life with no possibility of parole for 28 years. The murders that Fournerette confessed to were Isabelle Laville, a 17-year-old girl from France. She vanished in Auxerre on December 11, 1987 on her way home from school. Her skeleton was located at the bottom of a well in the country north of Auxerre in July 2006. Farida Heligarch, the girlfriend of one of a gang of bank robbers, a former cellmate of former rats. He killed her in 1988 in order to gain access to the group's money. He bought his chateau in France with the proceeds. Fabienne Leroy, 20. She disappeared in 1988 in Chalins and Champagne and her body was discovered in the nearby woods. She was killed by a shot to the heart following attempts to inject air into her veins. Jean-Marie Desremont, a 22-year-old French student. She disappeared in 1989 from the Charleville mazirs railway station and her body was found on Fournerette's estate, with his assistance. Elizabeth Brichat, a 12-year-old Belgian girl who disappeared from Namur in 1989 after playing with friends. Her disappearance was originally considered to be the work of Marc Dutrex, until Fournerette led police to her grave on his estate in France. Natasha Danes, a 13-year-old French girl who disappeared November 1990 in Nantes while shopping with her mother. Her body was discovered on the local beach a few days later. Céline Saison, 18, who disappeared in Charleville-Mazirs in 2000. 
her body was discovered in Belgium. Mananya Thumpong, 13, disappeared in 2001 from Sudan. Her body was found in Belgium. Fornaret was named as a suspect in connection with the murder of 20-year-old Englishwoman Joanna Parrish, whose body was discovered in a river in Oser on May 17, 1990. She had been raped and strangled, but he was never charged with this murder and it is unsolved to this day. 9. Farah Ranksi Farah Ranksi, also known as the Black Widow, was a Romanian serial killer who reportedly confessed to poisoning 35 people, including two of her husbands, multiple lovers and her son by arsenic during the 1920s. The details of her birth, marriages, arrest, conviction, incarceration and even death are not very clear, but most sources place her murders around Berkarekel, Yugoslavia, present-day Serbia. It's not entirely certain to this day whether this story is fact or hoax. Some accounts say that Renksi was born in Bucharest in 1903, but due to the estimated dates of her alleged murders, a date in the late 19th century would fit better. There isn't much documented evidence of her early life. It is known that her mother died when she was 13 and she moved with her father to Bersic Reckelmer where she went to boarding school. By the age of 15 her attitude was completely uncontrollable and she had frequently run away from home with various boyfriends, most of whom she was much younger than. Friends from Ranksy's childhood described her as having an almost pathological desire for constant male companionship and was highly jealous and suspicious by nature. Just before turning 20, Ranksy married Karl Schick, a wealthy Austrian banker who was many years older than her. They had a son together named Lorenzo. As she was left at home all the time while her husband worked, she began to suspect that he was being unfaithful and one evening she flew into a jealous rage and poisoned his dinner wine with arsenic. She began telling family, friends and neighbors that he had abandoned her and her son. After Ranksy had been in mourning for approximately a year, she declared that she had heard word of her supposedly estranged husband's death in a car accident. After hearing of her husband's car accident, Ranksy remarried, this time to a man closer to her age. Again, Ranksy became suspicious that her new husband was having an affair and after only a few months of marriage the man vanished and Ranksy again told friends and family that he had abandoned her. After a year had passed, she claimed that she had received a letter from her husband telling her that he was leaving forever. She did not remarry. However, she spent the next few years having a number of affairs, some with married men and others openly. The men were from a variety of backgrounds and social positions, but all would vanish within months, weeks, and sometimes just days after beginning a relationship with her. She would often make up stories about men abandoning her and being unfaithful. The police were called to investigate after the wife of one of Ranksy's lovers followed him to her residence one evening and the man never returned home. After searching Ranksy's wine cellar, they found 32 unburied, zinc-lined coffins. Each contained a male corpse in various stages of decay. Ranksy was arrested and taken into custody where she confessed to having poisoned the 32 men with arsenic after they had been unfaithful to her. She also confessed that more than once she had sat in her armchair amidst the coffins, surrounded by all of her former lovers. She confessed to murdering both of her husbands and her son Lorenzo. She said that one day, after Lorenzo had come to visit, he accidentally discovered the coffins in the wine cellar and had threatened to blackmail her so she poisoned him and disposed of his body. She was already fearful that he would soon leave her to get married so she held him in her arms as he died so she would be the last person he hugged. She was convicted of 35 murders and sentenced to life imprisonment, where she subsequently died. 10. Antonis Daglis Antonis Daglis, the Athens Ripper, was a Greek serial killer who was convicted of killing three women and attempting to murder six others. His sentence was 13 life terms plus 25 years. Daglis was a truck driver whose preferred victim type was prostitutes. His crime spree lasted from 1992 to 1995. Daglis had previously been jailed for seducing a minor in 1988 and attacking a group of men with a knife in 1989. Daglis came to the attention of police as a murder suspect after being arrested for the rape and abduction of Tourist and Hampson. Upon arrest, Daglis confessed to raping, strangling and dismembering two women, 
and attempting to kill a further six. He also admitted robbing all eight women. He dismembered the bodies of Eleni Panagiotopoula, 29, and Athena Lazaro, 26, with hacksaws and disposed of their body parts in various locations around Athens. He also confessed to murdering a prostitute whose body had been found in a dumpster in 1992. Antonis Daglis committed suicide in August 1997. I hated all prostitutes and continued to hate them. I went to meet them for sex but suddenly other pictures came into my head. I heard voices which ordered me to kill. Once I thought about strangling my fiancé, but I restrained myself. While these individuals may be infamous for their crimes, it is important to remember the innocent victims and their families whose lives were forever changed by these acts of violence. Let us not forget the importance of justice and the continued efforts of law enforcement to prevent the recurrence of such atrocities. To follow the first and second parts, you will find the links below this video or in a pinned comment. Thank you for watching, and please subscribe for more videos like this.